there, everybody. This is Alan Feldman from the Laguna Woods Democratic Club. Thank you for taking your time to watch. And what you're watching is another segment of our program, Black in Laguna Woods. If you've seen the show before, you'll find this particular segment a little different than what we've done in the past. Usually we do a half hour show. This show is going to be 60 minutes long, one hour long. That's why you're watching us at a different time than, we, than we're usually on. Uh, the reason our show is running long this week is because we're showing a video. We're showing about a 20 minute video, uh, which we'll discuss uh, uh, in, in just a minute. Uh, what we're going to do is show the video, and then after the video is shown, we're going to have a discussion about what was on it, what that video said, what it showed, and also probably some of the issues that the video brings up, which maybe aren't there, but are, let us say, lurking in the background. So before we get started showing the showing the video, let's uh, meet the person who's going to who's going to be doing the lion's share of the discuss discussion. <laughs> I'm going to ask her to uh, introduce herself and just tell us all a little bit about herself, just who you are and what you did. So Sharon, you take it away. Thanks, Alan. And uh, I count it an honor and a privilege to be here to discuss this today. All right. But uh, my husband and I have been in Laguna Laguna Woods for six years. And, um, and it's been a wonderful experience. I always want to like, you know, put that uh, out there. But again, I mentioned that uh, it's an honor and a privilege to, to bring to you these 10 African-American uh, women uh, who are inventors. And it's sad to say, I never knew anything about any one of them. Uh, I wasn't taught Black history in school, and I'm a native, you know, Los Angelian, uh, but it was Black history wasn't taught to me uh, in school. So it was a surprise. It was a pleasant surprise. I'm so proud because what these ladies, you know, have invented, have made my life easier, as well as I know uh, other people, you know, around the globe. So I'm glad to be here today. Well, we're we're really glad to have you. The honor the honor is ours, not <laughs> yours. <laughs> we really do appreciate you being here. Uh, and uh, that is the video that we're showing. What Sharon was talking about that the title of is it Ten Black Women Inventors, and it's it's an episodic video. It's, uh, it tells short stories about each of the people, the, what they did, and a little bit about their background and some of what they had overcome to do it and what happened with their inventions. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's quite interesting. And, and not only does it tell the story of, of these 10 individual peoples, when I watched it, and I haven't seen it in a month or so, last time I saw it was maybe a month or so ago. But when I saw it, it just, it, 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 it reminded me of like almost a cornucopia. It was an opening to things. Uh, it, it, you know, it was, yes, it was these people's stories and these stories are really interesting. And yes. these stories, great achievements of overcoming tremendous odds. Uh, they were great achievements. But beyond that, you could see the possibilities just by the, the actions of these 10, 10 people, what they were able to do, you could see the possibilities uh, of, of the world of, of, you know, what could, what could be if we just opened our eyes and accepted people for pe being for being people anyway uh one thing i do have to tell you before we watch the video we have a slight technical problem at the end of the video we decided to show this last one anyway as i said the uh, the video is an episodic video so it, it, it's got like i'll call them 10 scenes of these 10 different people on the last one the ninth and the tenth is a little problem with the video and the audio. The audio is fine. The, the voiceover for the 10th person, you will hear perfectly. However, when you're looking at the screen for a while, it keeps the picture that it had for the ninth person. So it's a little, it's a little head spinning. Uh, but the words that you're hearing are the words that they're talking about the 10th inventor. Eventually, it catches up with itself and it makes more sense. So don't, uh, you don't have to, you know, don't what, what's going on here? They're talking. They're talking expertly. <laughs> Tell us why. Just a technical glitch, which for which we apologize for. But we thought that all of these inventions are very important, and all yes. these people deserve yes. uh, 
whatever kind of moment in the sun we we're able to give them here. So uh, if we could start the video right now, that'd be great. So if we could start the video, start the video and we will be back and we will talk about what we've just seen, what it was and what it could mean in the future. Oh, and welcome back. In this Black Excellence presentation, we will highlight 10 Black women inventors. Welcome to BlackExcellence.com, the site where we share Black excellence, opulence, and affluence. Our mission is to inspire you as we enlighten you. We here at Black Excellence specialize in illuminating the experience and contributions of African Americans, which is the foundation of our channel. We are particularly keen on pointing out the ingenuity, innovation, and creativity of Black women who have transformed this world in ways that few can believe. It is essential for the Black community as well as white America to understand the impact of Black women pioneers, entrepreneurs, and inventors from our past. Our aspiring grade school student will not read much about these women in the history books, so we hope you take the time to celebrate these trailblazers who may inspire them and help propel their dreams forward. In this original Black Excellence video, we will be featuring 10 African American women whose inventions changed the world. So without further ado, let's get started. Number one, Patricia Bath, pioneer in ophthalmology. Patricia Bath's name is associated with many amazing feats and pioneering works from childhood till her death in 2019. Bath was born to Rupert Bath and Gladys Bath on November 4, 1942 in Harlem, New York. Although her parents were not rich, they encouraged her to pursue academic interests and explore new cultures. Her interest in science peaked when she got a chemistry set as a gift. She worked hard in her academic pursuits and made discoveries that earned her the Mademoiselle's Magazine Merit Award in 1960. Bath earned her bachelor's degree from Hunter College in 1964 and her medical degree with honors from Howard University in 1968. Bath began to pursue a fellowship in ophthalmology at Columbia University. During the course of her studies there, she discovered that African Americans were twice as likely to suffer from blindness and eight times more likely to suffer from glaucoma. These findings motivated her to invent devices and systems to change the outcomes. One of her brilliant inventions is the laser phaco probe, for which she became the first African American female doctor to hold a patent for a medical device. The device, which was completed in 1986, provided a less painful and precise treatment of cataracts using laser technology, and she received the patent for it in 1988. With the device, Bath was able to restore the sight of people with about 30 years of blindness. Thus, pioneering laser eye surgery is known today. She also pioneered community ophthalmology clinics during her residency years and co-founded the American Institute for the Prevention of Blindness in 1976, which established that eyesight is a basic human right. Bath won many prestigious awards in her lifetime and continued to advocate for innovation in telemedicine. Number two, Marie Van Britten Brown, pioneer in surveillance systems. Brown was born in Queens, New York on October 22, 1922. She worked as a nurse and was married to Albert Brown, an electronics technician. The crime rate in their neighborhood was high and police response time was slow. Coupled with the unfixed hours of the police force, Hush Marie to look for ways to increase the level of personal security in her home. She needed to create a system that would allow her to know who was at her home and contact relevant authorities as quickly as possible. That idea birthed the invention of the first home security system and the basis of modern surveillance systems, remote control doors, and push-button alarms. Brown's security system comprised of peepholes, a camera, monitors, a two-way microphone, and an alarm button that could be pressed to contact the police immediately. The peepholes were placed at three levels on the front door, the top one for tall persons, the middle one for people of average height, and the bottom one for children. A camera was mounted at the opposite side of the door with the ability to slide up and down through the peepholes and project the image on a monitor through a wireless system. The microphone was to enable her to speak to the person at the door and the person could speak back. If the person was perceived as an intruder, the alarm button will alert the police at once. 
but if the person was a friend, the door could be opened by remote control. Marie and Albert Brown filed for a patent on August 1, 1966, under the title Home Security System Utilizing Television Surveillance, and it was granted on December 2, 1969. Brown's invention gained her well-deserved recognition, including an award from the National Scientist Committee in an interview with the New York Times on December 6, 1969. Brown resided in New York with her family of three until her death on February 2, 1999. Number 3. Miriam Benjamin, Inventor of the Signal Chair Miriam Benjamin was born as a free person on September 16, 1861, to parents Frances and Eliza Benjamin in Charleston, South Carolina. Her family moved to Boston, Massachusetts with the hope for better schooling. She attended high school in Boston, then moved to Washington, D.C., where she worked as a school teacher and a federal clerk. She later enrolled in to Howard University Law School. While Miriam worked as a school teacher, she invented the Hong and Signal Chair for hotels. She thought of a way to get the attention of the waiters in a hotel from the comfort of your chair. The chair had two components, a buzzer button and a light signal. When the button is pressed, it would buzz at the waiter's station, and a light on the chair would let the waiter know who wanted service. In her patent notes, she said the chair would serve to reduce the expense of hotels by decreasing the number of waiters in attendance, to add to the convenience and comfort of guests, and to obviate the necessity of hand clapping or calling aloud to obtain the services of pages. Miriam received patent for her invention in 1888, making her the second African-American woman to receive a patent in the United States. She lobbied to have her chair adopted by the United States House of Representatives, but they eventually installed a copycat version of hers that she didn't get credit for. Miriam became a solicitor of patents and moved back to Boston in 1920 to live with her mother and work for her brother, Edgar Pinkerton Benjamin, a noted attorney. Benjamin's invention was the precursor to the flight attendant call button, a key tool for customer service and service in the airline industry. Number 4. Sarah Good, Inventor of the Folding Cabinet Bed Sarah Good was born enslaved in 1850 and received no form of formal education while growing up. After receiving her freedom at the end of the Civil War, Good moved to Chicago with her husband, Archibald, who was a carpenter. She became an entrepreneur, and together with her husband, they owned a furniture store. Sarah realized that many of her customers were working-class people who lived in small apartments and didn't have enough space for many furniture, sometimes including beds. She thought of her way to utilize such small space while providing the comfort of a bed as well. Thus, she invented the folding cabinet bed. The folding cabinet bed comprised of a bed, which could be concealed when not in use to serve as a roll-top desk, with compartments for stationery and other writing supplies. This invention made her customers have both the comfort of a bed in their home and the luxury of a desk for writing activities. The bed attached to the cabinet was wide enough to accommodate two adults or an adult and two children. The folding cabinet bed was a timely and satisfying invention and is the predecessor to the modern-day Murphy bed. Good was granted a patent for her invention on July 14, 1885 by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. This made her the first African-American woman in history to receive a patent for an invention. She died in 1905 at the age of 55 years. Number 5. Marjorie Stewart Joyner, Pioneer in Cosmetology Marjorie Stewart Joyner was born on October 24, 1896 in Monterey, Virginia. She moved to Chicago and began studying cosmetology at the A.B. Moeller Beauty School in 1912. In 1916, she became the first African-American graduate of the school. That same year, at the age of 20, she got married to Robert E. Joyner, a podiatrist, and opened her salon. In Chicago, Joyner met another influential beautician and businesswoman who ran several beauty schools in the country, Madam C.J. Walker. In 1920, Joyner joined the C.J. Walker Beauty Colleges as the national supervisor. In the early 1920s, African American women were accustomed to straightening their hair with very hot curling irons. This process was slow and uncomfortable because only one iron could be used at a time. This made Joyner think of ways to improve on this method. 
One day while making a pot roast in her kitchen, Joyner looked at the roast which was being held together and heated with several thin long rods from within. She envisioned a similar system that would use several rods hung above the client's head which could roll several portions of the hair at once. Then they could be heated up to produce a permanent wave or curl into her hair for a few days. In 1926, she began experimenting until she achieved a feasible prototype. She received a U.S. patent for her invention, the Perfect Wave Machine, in 1928. The following year, she invented a scalp protector to make the curling process more comfortable for the clients. However, the patents for both products were assigned to Madam Walker, and Joyner didn't receive any substantial compensation for her inventions, which is very unfortunate. Her inventions were used in many salons on both black and white clients, and she continued to create systems to uphold the standards of beauticians in the country. In 1973, she was awarded a bachelor's degree in psychology from Bethune-Cookman College in Daytona Beach. She remained dedicated to community service and died in 1994. Number 6. Judy Reed, inventor of the dough kneader and roller. Judy Reed was born during the time of slavery, therefore there is no proper documentation available in regards to her birth and childhood. However, it was discovered that she lived in Washington, D.C. when it was unlawful for enslaved people to be taught how to read and write and would be harshly punished or killed if caught learning or teaching. In January 1884, Reed applied for a patent on her dough kneader and roller. The device was an improved design on existing dough kneaders. Her device comprised of two rollers, corrugated slats, a covered receptacle. This device allowed dough to mix evenly as it progressed between the two rollers carved with corrugated slats that would act as kneaders. Then the dough passed into a covered receptacle to keep it clean and protected. The patent was granted September 23, 1884 to a person who signed X for this dough kneader and roller. It is believed that Judy Reed signed X because she was unable to spell her name or write. This technicality is the reason why Reed is not officially recognized as the first African American female patent holder. Number 7. Sarah Boone Improved the Ironing Board Sarah Boone was born as Sarah Marshall in 1832 in Craven County, North Carolina. In 1847, at age 15, she married James Boone in New Bern, North Carolina. Before the Civil War, she and her husband moved to New Haven, Connecticut. She worked as a dressmaker while her husband was a brick mason. As a dressmaker and a mother of eight children, Boone found ironing of female sleeves and garments difficult to iron because they were curved and slim. Ironing in that period was done on either a pair of chairs or across a flat surface with an iron heated over a stove or fire. This was usually done in the kitchen because of the proximity to the stove or fire. Boone invented an improvement to the already existing ironing boards. Her board was designed to be effective in ironing sleeves and bodies of female garments. The board was narrow and curved, which was the fit of a female sleeve in that period. The board was reversible, thereby making it easier to iron both sides of the sleeves. It was also suited for ironing curved waist seams of garments. In her patent application, Boone stated that the purpose of her invention was to produce a cheap, simple, convenient, and highly effective device, particularly adapted to be used in ironing the sleeves and bodies of ladies' garments. Boone's ironing board was granted patent on April 26, 1892. 2. Boone passed away in 1904. Number 8. Ellen Eglin, inventor of the clothes wringer. Ellen Eglin was born in 1849 in Washington, D.C., where she lived through her childhood and adult years. While living in D.C., Eglin worked as a housekeeper and a government clerk. Washing clothes at this time was only done by hand, and wringing out the clothes and drying them was also done by hand. Ellen realized that there had to be a better way to wring water out of the clothes, so she put her mind to work and came up with an invention that changed the process of washing and made it very efficient and comfortable. She called it the clothes wringer. 
In the 1800s, Eglin invented a clothes wringer, which was a machine that comprised of two rollers in a frame that was connected to a crank. The clothes would be placed in between the two rollers, and as the crank was turned, the clothes would have the water pressed out of them. She applied for patent and was granted. However, Eglin sold her patent to a white person who was interested in manufacturing the product for a token of $18. In 1890, she was featured in the April issue of the Woman Inventor magazine, where she was asked the reason for selling her patent, and she replied saying, You know I am black, and if it was known that a Negro woman patented the invention, white ladies would not buy the ringer. I was afraid to be known because of my color and having it introduced to the market. That is the only reason. The buyer of the patent went ahead to produce the product and made considerable financial rewards for it. Eglin's ringer is still being used today. Number 9. Lydda Newman, inventor of a new style of hairbrush. Lydda Newman was born in Ohio in 1885, but she lived in Ohio until the late 1890s when according to the official census records, she became a New York City resident. Newman was a hairdresser by trade and also a women's rights activist. She fought alongside well-known women's suffrage activists for women's right to vote. As a hairdresser, Newman thought of ways to improve her business and came up with an improved hairbrush design. This was a period when women were becoming self-aware and standing up for their rights. And Newman not only brought revolution as an activist, she also designed hairdressing products that added to the ease of women. In 1898, Newman applied for a United States patent for a new style of hairbrush. Her hairbrush design included features that promoted efficiency and hygiene. The bristles were evenly spaced in rows, with open slots to guide debris away from the hair into a compartment, and a back that could be opened at the touch of a button for cleaning out the compartment. The hairbrush was not only efficient, it was also stylish. Newman was granted the patent for her hairbrush on November 15, 1898. In the 1920s, Newman headed a group in her neighborhood that created awareness about women's right to vote. Newman continued to fight for women's rights, and worked as a hairdresser to a private family throughout her adulthood. Number 10, Alice H. Parker, inventor of the central heating using natural gas. Alice Parker was born in 1895 in Morristown, New Jersey. She had her early childhood education in New Jersey before relocating to Washington, D.C. She attended classes at the Howard University Academy, which was a high school affiliated to Howard University. She earned a certificate with honors from the Academy in 1910. Growing up in New Jersey, the winters were harsh, and Alice felt like her fireplace was not effective enough in warming her home through the cold winters. This prompted her to design a more efficient way of supplying heat during winters. She is credited with the invention of the central heating using natural gas. Parker's central heating system allowed cool air to be drawn into the furnace, then conveyed through a heat exchanger that delivered warm air through ducts to individual rooms of a house. Her invention was convenient and decreased the need for people to go outside to chop or cut wood during winters. It also decreased the risk of house fires associated with fireplaces. Although the concept of central heating was already around before Parker's birth, her design was cutting edge because it made use of natural gas instead of coal or wood like others. Her invention paved way for the use of natural gas and energy conservation in central heating systems that we have in our homes today. Parker was granted United States patent for her invention on December 23, 1919. We appreciate the fact that you stayed with us until the end. Thank you for spending time with us and don't forget to like this video. Also, make sure you subscribe so that you never miss a video. Bye for now. We will see you tomorrow. I want to also thank um, the organization Black Excellence who uh, graciously allowed us to use this entire video. You know, you have to get people's permission to use them. And uh, they were very nice. They told us we could use any video that they had Wonderful. We could just use without even asking, and they hoped it would enhance our discussion. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> well, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to start. I want to ask a question. This is something that I had, and you actually mentioned it before, but something, the question I had the first time I saw this, like the first video, uh, Bath is her name, Patricia Bath, the woman yes. who uh, 
is responsible for developments in laser surgery. Uh, there's a woman who didn't follow uh, laser surgery, which is something that millions of people in, uh, use today yes. here in this country, probably hundreds of millions throughout yes. the world. It's almost a miracle. Uh, she had invented things that would, would develop things that would help cure blindness. I mean, she was, let's call her a heavy hitter. She did some big time stuff. I, I think so. I'm with you. I never heard of her before. Why haven't we heard of her? Why do you think we haven't heard of her? You know, uh, for one thing, you know, she's she's a woman in a man's, you know, field. You know, she's in, uh, you know, she's she's a doctor. She's she's an inventor. Uh, you know, and I I just don't think that like uh, women, you know, like get the press or, or, you know, or get the media attention. I mean, she is a contemporary. She was in, you know, a hospital in Los Angeles and I never heard of her, you know what I mean? So a lot has to do with, uh, you know, racism and, and, then everything else that has, you know, like kept black people, you know, like, I, well, okay, let's put it this way. The achievements of black people, you know, you know, like away from the media, we always get the attention for the wrong that we do. But then here, here are women who, who have, you know, like stepped up and, you know, invented things that have made our lives like much easier and then we've never even heard, heard of them. So like I said, multiple forms of, you know, discrimination and, uh, and everything else. Uh, but you can't take our brains away from us. You know what I mean? So, you know, uh, my head goes off to uh, Patricia Bath and the other, you know, nine women like on this list that have been featured. So, yeah. It, it's it's like strike one, you're a person of color, strike two, you're a woman, yeah. you know, so we're going to bring somebody in from the bullpen here <laughs> to help you out. It's, 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 it's interesting. I've been I'm thinking, you know, we know, we, you know, we know about, we know, we know Walter Reed, right? The medical hero who yeah. Yeah. cured yellow fever. We, uh, we know Dr. Salk and Dr. Sabin, both polio. We know Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin. We know these people. You know they. They, they got they, press. They, they got exactly. They got. They got, they got press. press. They got press. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, other people just don't. Their 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 achievements are. Uh, I won't say they're denigrated necessarily. They can be, but sometimes they're just not. They're just not noticed until somebody else who has more, what would be the word, more, I don't know, better known than they are, or more like the people who usually invent things, brings it up, then it's, exactly. oh, this, is, this exactly. is wonderful. And then, Alan, Unexpected. I really think that you hit the, you know, like the nail on the uh, head. It's like people who normally invent things. Women don't normally invent things. You know, women Especially are regulated women to the household, you know, to, That's right. to like domestic type things and a black woman inventing things. I mean, that's something that's, you know, uh, you know, unheard of. And hey, again, it's like I'm just amazed at at these accomplishments and we don't know anything about them. I had you ever heard of any of these 10 10 women? Yeah, I'm, I haven't heard. I haven't heard. I haven't heard. I didn't hear about any of them until I started. Saying, let me yeah. let me just pick up. I want to pick up something that that you had said. This would be like a side point on that. Okay. The women are usually expected to be at the home. When you were growing up, did you have a lot of that? Was that pressure put on you, or just say, this is what you're going to do, whether you want to or not? This is just what's going to happen. Not not at all. I was raised by you know like you know like black women. Uh, in like all various degrees, like, you know, like in their careers or like the workforce. My grandmother, you know, like was a stay-at-home person, but then we lived in like 
like multi-generational, you know, household. So she took care of the kids. She cooked and cleaned and washed and cooked our dinner and sent us off, off, sent us, you know, like off to school. But then my mother and aunts all worked, you know, my mother worked in like aerospace. My aunts worked, worked at, you know, like Mattel toys. So, you know, I saw, uh, you know, women working, women at home, and we didn't ever think anything less of our grandmother because, you know, she, you know, she was at home. She took care of us. I mean, that was, you know, like a vital role. And then, you know, we, we had the men in our family that uh, my grandfather, you know, uh, owned like a store. So I had all different types of uh, experience. So I never was re relegated to like, my life's work was going to be, you know, you know, like in the home, it was like, it's wide open for you. Now, yet I had teachers who would tell me, well, you know, you know, like you can't do this, you know, like you can't do that. And it was like, why? But, you know, no, I, I never got that message, you know, like growing up in my household that like the world, you know, the world is your oyster. It's not your, you know, it's not your oyster. So I saw women in all type of roles. Yeah, you had, they had expectations, both you and your family had expectations. Yes. For yes. That's really, I think that's really important when you, when you're um, a young person, you know, you're just going to, it's easy to just to follow a path that's kind of laid it, out. Exactly. And see, I'm the first one in my family to even go to college. Okay. And my family, uh, you know, I came from the South, you know, like to California and, uh, you know, but. I knew that education was the way for me. So, you know, yeah. and I was the first to yeah. graduate, uh, um, you know, in my family. So. Well, did you go to school out here in California? Yes. I went to school. I went to elementary. I was born in California. You born so in I, California. Yeah, yeah. I did all my school. I even went to college, you know, college here. So, and again, but I, I want to say this, I never learned anything about black history in school that's right. you know like that's in right. california which i think but at is least you, the you know uh yeah. we didn't learn about black history until you know you know like black history month <laughs> so. right. 10 minutes of that what's next <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly and and learning okay. and learning about all these accomplishments I don't see why black history is rele relegated to a month. To me, yeah. these women, I mean, it should be something going on, you know, like all the time. Uh, I mean, this is, these women are great, you know. And, so, let's move to another one. Let's talk okay. about another one. Uh, the woman who uh, invented the, basically the surveillance system. She was number two, the, the <laughs> second person we spoke of. Name is uh, Maria. You know, I can't even read my own writing. I wrote out her I'm name. I'm Britton and I Brown. Read, well, I'm Britton Brown. There we, I right. wrote it right. <laughs> so uh, I'm curious. What, what do you? Uh, what's your? What's your take on her? I mean, her. her what she developed with her husband too is uh, is uh, is something that's still in use today, and most people's very important maybe we see ads for them on television all the time if, if she she's everywhere you know what i mean you know yeah. like they should have her name hanging off <laughs> off of everything <laughs> the way that we are so sur surveyed nowadays you know what i mean but right, right. that industry is a 47.5 billion industry and i have never heard again i i, I know that i'm you know i know that i'm repeating myself but She's the one who, you know, who, who invented all this stuff out of a need, you know, like for her family's safety. And it's like, you know, why, why, you know, and, and, and every time, like I, I hear each of these women and like what they've invented, my question is, but how did they benefit financially from like all of this? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, they should be super rich, you know? So, you know, like, I'm not sure, you know, like about, uh, is it, is it Marie Van Britten Brown? But 
I just sure hope that she was able to get to get paid financially, you know, like all of, yeah. out, out of all this, because we're talking about talking about closed circuit, you know, like television and uh, and if anybody has benefited any in any way from, you know, from any surveillance uh, surveillance system, they should think, you know, like this African African American woman. You know, I really do think that a subtitle to this whole thing is a day without an African American woman, you know, like in your life. And it feels like we can't get away from them because I mean, it's like some of the simplest things. Some of the things that like right. you could even think of an African American woman invented. And I am just so, so, so proud of that. I really am. So. Yeah, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's quite an achievement. It's, it's, especially with the, uh, the obvious obstacles yes. that people have to come. Not only obstacles to be able to be in a position to do the work, as a rule, African Americans are, don't have a lot of wealth, which means that uh, you know you can't sit there and think about surveillance systems. You got to knit those clothes. You, know, you exactly. got to you got to sweep them floors. You know you got to do that stuff. You got to you know you got to do you got to do what you what you need to do to work. Uh, but is, yet they did. But they did. Yep. You know, even with right. like all of that, they still were able to. You know. You know still were able to like invent these things. So my, my hat goes out to them, you know, it, you know, it does, it really does. Yeah. They had to, all of, all of these people. And I mean, some of the, some of their inventions are earth shattering. Some of the yes. inventions are household yeah. items, which we, which we use all the time. Yep. Uh, doesn't mean they're not important or difficult to invent. Exactly. Just means that they're not a, they don't have the effect on the world as uh, laser surgery, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, but they have, the combination of ingredients it takes to actually do that. There's a lot of people who probably have the talent enough to do it, but they don't have the push, the drive, oh. the determination to do it. These people have it all. It's like, you know, it's, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make another sport. I make a lot of sports and it's baseball season. So it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> but it is like sports, you know, it's like minor league baseball. They put you in this situation, playing 140 games in 144 days. Okay. And you do it. You know, you're, you know, you're six foot two, you're thin, you're fast, you have great reflexes, you can catch, run up, catch anything. Can you play 140 games in 144 <laughs> days? If you can't, goodbye. You know, it's the same thing with inventions. Can you, you know, can you go to your job? Albert Einstein worked at the, uh, at the patent office in, in Zurich while he was writing the theory of relativity. Oh, really? Of course, he could. Yeah, and I could daydream out the window. Nobody would know. <laughs> but, you know, hey, but it, it, you know, the, the fact is that you have to have more than one thing to do these things. Yes. You have, to have a combination of ingredients to do it. And these people really have. So let's let's move to, to somebody to somebody else. I don't know if she I wonder if she ever benefited from that. She's, she was interviewed by the New York Times, but we don't know what that means. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that might be something uh and uh, the other person I, I'd, I'd be interested in talking about too if we could if you're interested also sure. the person who invented the bed the folding bed what's now known as the murphy bed sarah good yeah uh she received the patent for it. and of course the first question is she invented it why is it called, called the Murphy bed? The Murphy bed. Why are we <laughs> saying the good bed? <laughs> Why is it the good bed? <laughs> but anyway, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. That's kind of a side thought. We wrote. Uh... <laughs> but you know, you know, it really is. That really is the thought. I mean, how is it that you know? Okay, she was born in slavery. No formal you know, like education, but because of the size of, you know, like of the living quarters, she was able to come up with a, what they called a folding cabinet that had, you know, that led down into a bed. I guess the only difference between her and William Lawrence Murphy, who was an Irish immigrant, was that his bed was on springs and it went up, uh -huh. you, know, you know, like <laughs> until the wall. That's, that's the only difference. You know, it wasn't a piece of furniture like with the desk and you fold it out and right. you had 
sides and it was the bed. His was like a wall thing, you know, like, and it came down. But still, why, why aren't we still calling it, you know, like a, you know, a good bed, you know, not a Murphy bed. And probably because, you know, he, he was male and, uh, and women aren't supposed to be inventing anything. So even though she, you know, she, she was the first African-American to receive a patent of any kind in 1885. Mm-hmm. And right. uh, Murphy's bed was patented in 1990. And from what I understood with, mm-hmm. with about patents is that, you know, uh, patents grant the inventor the rights to uh, patented process design or invention for a designated period in exchange for a comprehensive disclosure of the invention. See, now I thought before I started researching this that once you got a patent, it was for life. They're only for designated, you know, like a you know, like period of time. So I didn't copy and copy copyrights all. also. Uh, oh, okay. See, so copyrights also. I think you have exclusive use to it for X amount of uh-huh. And I know you can renew your copyright. I'm not okay. sure if you can renew your pet. Your pet. And actually, copyright gives you very good protection, but protection because the Walt Disney Company needed copyrights to copyright Mickey Mouse and Donald okay. Duck, okay. all those characters. So copyrights now will last. Basically, basically they will last forever. Thanks to okay. the Walt Disney Company. Okay. For pa- uh, pa- so I don't uh, know about Pat. No. So. No. But yeah, no. it is. It is. It is. It is. I mean, we don't even know, or we didn't know until today, that the Murphy bed is actually an improvement on something that existed yes. before. Yes. You know, yeah. that's not even mentioned. It's a, if it came right out of his head. It was as if nobody. No. You know, nobody wow. else. Uh, nobody else really thought of it. So, uh, I, I guess the, the other another person I'd like to I'd like to talk to all talk about also is uh, uh, maybe just briefly, but the, the person who did the the uh, the the dough eater and the roller. Her name is uh, Judy Judy Reed. Okay. Uh, the thing that got me is that she signed by an X. She an couldn't X. read her. How could she invent something if she can't write? Exactly. What kind of ingenuity does that take? Exactly, exactly. And it does say that like little is written about her life, but she was uh, garnered the title of being the first African American to receive a you know like U- U.S. patent. So she was like the first. The other ones were mm-hmm. up there, but she you know like she's the uh, first and. You know, my thing is, if she signed it, you know, like with an X, I mean, who do you have to be president in order to do that? I mean, how do we know like that's her X or like somebody else's? You know what I mean? I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking. I'm just saying. Good but, boy. Make your mark. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So. Well. That's just a, that's just a thing, you know. We 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 discussed some of these beforehand, and that would kind of slip by me. But I'm looking at it now. How did she but, invent something with, with an X? She couldn't write and read or write. How do you invent something? Exactly. But okay. But did you see that machine? You know, like when they showed yes. it on the video. I mean, it was a sophisticated, you know, machine. So good for right. you, Judy Reed. You know what I mean? So. Uh, and I'm sure the baking industry or anybody who's baking on a large scale level is, you know, is thanking her also. OK, so this is another right. one that yeah. uh, and it says That's like right. she was never officially recognized, you know, like for this invention either. You know what I mean? So right. well, the thing is, I could, you know, I, I've been able to read and write basically since I was seven or eight years old, but I can't invent that. You know, I no. got the other parts of the equation. No, no. Yeah. But, but then what's amazing too, Alan, is that black people were the ones, you know, like who were doing doing all the work. So right. we we invented things to make our lives easier. That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. Said, Have you ever tried to knead some bread? No, you you no, probably haven't. No. But if you watch watch some of these cooking shows sometimes and watch them, I, mean, I, that, is I do, hard. I do. that is labor intensive. I, so I, these I, inventions were done to make our lives easier. You know what I mean? Because we were, you know, working for people. So it wasn't the people who were working for who was doing all this stuff. 
we were the ones doing the work, whether it was in the house or, you know, like wherever else they they had us working. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's almost the converse of sports. Look at the sports we have. They're all, you know, upper body strength, using your arms, using your legs, agility, speed, strength. Why is that all invented by men? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they leave yeah. out the endurance part, the part about, you know, being being supple and being able to rotate and use your hips and all that, which are the things that women do better. But men invented them, so this is what we play. Exactly. <laughs> it's just really, exactly. it's really, it's just what you're talking about. So we got to move on here. Okay. Because we're okay. Starting to run. Uh, okay. We want to want to talk about at least two more of these people and okay. and, and something else too. And the first is going to be uh, Ellen Eglin, who invented the clothes <laughs> ringer. Yep. And ended up selling her pat. So that's an interesting story uh -oh. too. So what, what's your take on that? Story? Oh my God! You know, uh, well. Having grown up and used the clothes wringer, you know what I mean? That's yeah. how we, you know, right, you know, like did, did our clothes. And we talked about too. get getting our too. hands, our hands caught in the wringer and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> but right. it's like, you know, she sold this patent, her patent for eighteen dollars. Now maybe back then in 1849, eighteen dollars might have been a lot of money. So somebody took advantage of Miss Eglin, okay? But then again, I like the fact that she said, uh, well, when asked, why did she sell it? And she stated, you know, I am black. And if it was known that a Negro woman patented the invention, white ladies would not buy the ringer. I was afraid to be known because of my color and having it introduced into the market. That's the only reason why. So. The only reason why she did it was because she was an African American woman and she knew that it wasn't going to be accepted. So she sold yeah. it so that her invention could be accepted. And her invention is the ancestor of our washing machine right now. So they were know, the washing machine for a time. Uh, yeah. Before, before people used electric washing. Machines. Exactly. You know, like you even said, who was it? Someone we were talking to said, "Yeah, I remember that. We had one in our in our house. They were yeah. that was yeah. a standard, you know, all over." So, right for eighteen dollars, and we have to say that a white entrepreneur mass produced it and made a whole lot of money. And seeing, I would think, okay, well, wouldn't you have given Miss Eglin something? You know what I mean? You bought it for eighteen dollars. That's what he gave it. <laughs> yeah, shared the wealth. <laughs> Goodness gracious, you know. There's a, there's a, there's another there's another story. Uh, if you uh, it's not about an invention, but uh, if you recall that 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 show was a really low grade show, but that show Cops. Yes. Uh, that was on, and they had this theme song, which was a pretty. The theme song was good. Bad boys, you know, bad uh -huh. boys. What you going uh -huh. to do now? I do. Well, the thing is that was that was written by a a, a group of uh, obviously reggae musicians for inner circle and they sold it for fifty dollars. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Maybe it was five hundred, I don't know. But the the point is what, the five hundred fifty, sold, same thing. It's right. The point is the same. They sold it and that thing was on I think that show just went off the air after like wow. thirty years on it. Wow. So that show was on you know, originally once a week and by the end of it five times a need a week on five different stations. They would have all been they would all been sitting back their feet up smoking cigars drinking a beer taking exactly. it easy now they're probably exactly. still playing before 50 people someplace so it's yeah. it really is the same sign of story and the thing is it's not just a black white thing it's a people with money against a people who, don't, who nobody yeah. knows things yeah. anyway yeah. anyway we have one one more inventor to talk about then there's somebody okay. else i'd like to talk to you okay time. And that is the last person that we discussed. The last person you might be, they had the wrong person's name up on the picked on the uh, on the screen, right. but the pictures right. were all of Alice Parker. What did you think? What did you think of Alice? Parker? Oh my God! Uh, when I'm cold, I think of Alice Parker all the time. <laughs> okay, I mean the central heating. Come on now, central heating, and gosh. And she said the goal was to offer central heating solution that was more efficient than wood and uh, and and coal. That was her, you know, uh, her 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 goal or her, you know, uh, the reason why she did all this. But it says too that she had 
zero experience in any, uh, you know, like right. in this trade, you know what I mean? So, you know, she wanted something safer because can you imagine that wood? I mean, the residue from the wood and, and coal, at least, you know, from uh, natural gas, I guess people weren't getting that sick, but I mean, this, this is, you know, phenomenal. Uh, and what it says is the gas furnace she invented was never adopted exactly to her specification, but it did resemble modern gas furnace models. Okay. Mm -hmm. So her specifications weren't adopted, but something that looked exactly or resembled hers, you know, like is what got accepted. So see, there was, there was something lost there too. And this was in, you know, like 1919, again, you know, like being a female, like in a field that men normally, you know, have reign in, uh, she was never uh, accepted for, for that. So, again, she was somebody else who who got slighted. Yes, yeah, somebody thought they could take advantage of her. And, and they, they did. It sounds like they were right. Okay, so yeah. that, that's the, the, the only people on there. There's somebody else I wanted to speak to you about. And we have to, I'm sorry we have to do it quickly because we are is always running out of money. Uh, but this is a Money really, or time? Time, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what was true. I thinking of? Huh? <laughs> All the money I get paid for doing this, huh? <laughs> Running out oh, of time. Okay, but but one thing about uh, Parker, it yes. says that she graduated from Har a Howard, you know, like uni yes. uh, university, which was rare. And I just want to do a shout out for like historic black, you know, you know, like college colleges and like universities. If it weren't for those colleges, a lot of uh, African Americans wouldn't have received like, you know, you know like higher, higher yeah. education. So Absolutely you know, I wanted right. to mention and, you know, that. Something else, they mentioned something in passing. I don't remember which person it was, but the person, uh, they ended up with several degrees, but they got their undergraduate degree from Hunter College in New York, they said. Uh -oh. I can't remember. Who, I'm sorry. I apologize. I can't remember who okay. it was. Okay. But Hunter College, in, in, in the city of New York, for years and years and years, City College of New York, of which Hunter College was a part of, it's like University of California out here. Okay. It was free. Anybody could go. Really? That's right. And it was free up until maybe a year or two after University of California started charging money too. So you had these free universities, which people did away with. They did away with it here because Ronald Reagan was able to convince people that all they're doing is going there and Take smoking dope, having girlfriends and, wow. and uh, wow. demonstrating. And they did it in New York because they opened it up to everybody and they were letting people in who literally could not read. But anyway, it was a great thing which benefited millions and millions of people. Yeah. One of the people in this. And the only person, and this is going to be quick because we, I, I spoke too long and I used a lot of our time. And that's the woman who basically invented downtown Los Angeles, Bridget B Biddy. Biddy, Biddy Mason. Mason. Not Mason. Mason. Yeah, Biddy Busy Mason. I'm, yeah. I'm wearing my glasses, so it's hard for me to read names. But anyway, just give us a little bit about her. Again, we, we only have a couple of minutes, so if you, if you be brief. She's a big person who deserves a lot of talk, but we'll just have to be brief here. For okay. Right. Well, uh, again, you know, she, she helped shape, you know, downtown, uh, you know, like Los Angeles. She was born a slave and was able to buy uh, her freedom. Uh, so, it says the first African-American Methodist church in LA was built on land she adopted. So, you know, Biddy Mason was a, was a landowner in like downtown, you know, like downtown uh, Los Angeles. Uh, let's see. Uh, she died in 1981 and was buried in an unmarked grave. Uh, so the only thing we have of Biddy Mason right now is a plaque in front of the First American uh, Methodist Church in downtown uh, LA that is standing right now. So although she is credited, you don't hear a lot about her, you know, like uh, either. Again, she shaped downtown Los Angeles, an African American woman. I, you know, my, my personal th feeling is that if uh, she was a white man, there wouldn't oh, be a plaque to her. There'd be a statue. Oh, She'd be up on a horse someplace. <laughs> 
you know, or, uh, or wielding a hammer or, or holding a sword. Well, you know, we, we are, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap this up because we are indeed running out of time. Okay. First of all, I want to thank a couple of people. Number one, I want to thank Pat Leftwich for running the Zoom on this. I think you did thank a great you, job and I really appreciate it. If it was up to me, I'm sure we would have ended up watching the Flintstones or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Technical expertise is not my, pl not my point. And another thing I want to say is like, because I'm the constant on this program. People think that I do all the work to bring all of this together. I'm the, you know, I'm the one who gets the guests and decides the topics and does everything. And the fact of the matter is that's simply not the truth. I have probably the easiest job of anybody on this. As I said before, when we started, all I need to do is put a few coherent sentences together <laughs> at the beginning and tell everybody that we're out of time at the end. Make sure that people have enough time to speak. Uh, it's really other people did it. And in this particular one, the person that did most of the talking is really the person that put it all together. Sharon put this all together. She picked the video. She found the video, which are not easy to find. And she picked it, you know, she picked it. She picked so all, all the credit for this goes to her. She's really the one that does it. And on the other shows, there's a lot of other people that work behind the scenes, including Dr. Fran Williams, who we've seen on this show, and Sue Deering, who really does, you know, we can't, we, we take an hour program to, to, to talk about <laughs> what she does. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I just want to make sure that people understand that now, since we have a little more time on this program than we normally do. But really, that's really what we have today. And Sharon, I want to thank you personally very much for putting it all together, staying on top of it. And I thought that you were terrific. You well, really you, were. Alan. You well, knew what you, you wanted to say and you said it. <laughs> <laughs> but so. then, Alan, you know, I also want to like shout out to, you know, you know, like Lorna Ryan, who right. was to, you know, like be on the show because she did an awful lot, you know, of like research too. So I wanted to That's thank her. Right. You know, as well as like Dottie, you know, That's like right. uh, uh, Hawkins also. So, you know, two yeah. two women here uh, who live in like in like in the village uh, who who really helped me, you know, like put this on. So I wanted. Yeah, to they were very helpful. Like I got an email that Lorna had sent that you forwarded to me, and yes. a lot of what we talked about was based upon yes. what Lorna. Yes. What Lorna had learned and brought up, and maybe I don't, I, I don't know her, so maybe she just knew it all off the top of her head. And Dottie is Dottie. We all love Dottie. I know Sue yes. Deering's been after Dottie for months to do this show, but <laughs> <laughs> she finally at least said yes. She couldn't do it, but she finally said yes. But she's not out of the woods yet, and uh, we got our eye on Lorna for it. Get her right, Alan. <laughs> we yeah. might, maybe we'll be able to get it. Two other people I'd like on the show is Lorna and I want Dr. Sparkle back. I love Dr. Sparkle. Oh, oh yeah. She's a character. She's yeah. a character. They were great. But anyway, uh, I, again, thank you very much. You, okay. you were really wonderful. You did a great job and you really put this together. You did a great job in all aspects of this. And for everybody watching, I want to thank you all for watching us. Uh, and we'll do this again. Uh, you know, we don't know what form it'll take uh, next month. It might be a usual half hour discussion. Maybe it'll be something similar to this, be an hour long, and we'll do something we haven't done before. But please keep keep an eye on for us uh, and please keep watching and just, you know, keep thinking. And it's like I say every week, just because it didn't happen to you doesn't mean it's not somebody else's truth. Exactly. It happened to them, exactly. not to you. So think how you'd feel if it did happen to you. Yeah. Okay. If we keep that in mind, we'll make a lot of progress. Sharon. Okay, sense. Alan. Uh, Lorna had a, a question. I think it begs an answer. What would you say to young African American women? You know what I mean? Who would be thinking about going into some of these uh, male-dominated fields or whatever? And uh, one of the things that Patricia Bath's uh, parents told her was never settle for less than your best. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's something that like, you know, a message for like all women, you know what I mean? Yeah. I so. think I think it, I think it's uh, you know just looking at it from the outside. Obviously, I'm uh -huh. not a person of color. I'm not a woman, and I'm not a person of color. Uh -huh. uh, looking at it from the outside, there's two ways it can go. Number one, there's a lot of obstacles in your path. Whether yes. you know the legal obstacles have fairly been removed right now, fairly, not all, but fairly. But there's other obstacles which you know you guys will know much better than I will. You, they're part of your daily life. They're not part of yes. Life. You're gonna yeah. reach. You're gonna meet those obstacles. You're gonna have to overcome it. But on the other side. There's this vast amount of talent 
which has not been developed by this country to our own detriment, which is just waiting, which includes black people, men, women, you know, Hispanic people, everybody. Yes. And if we tap the right vein, if we proceed in the right direction, that's going to explode all over this country yes. and all over the world. Yes. So that's what we have in front of us. That's something that's worth working for. That's something that's trying to overcome these seemingly impossible obstacles yes. and transits and people who won't deal with facts and won't deal with reality. So that's what that's what I would say, you know, my advice okay. for whatever that's worth. That's the way okay. I see it. That's anyway, thank, thank, you for, thank, thank you all very much. for Thank you all very much for being with us. And uh, we will see you next time. Thanks a lot, Pat. You can turn us off. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye.